What's up? Welcome to the Confluence VC podcast. This podcast is meant to give you a personal glimpse into the next era of investors and operators. This week we had on Helene Servion from Journey One Ventures. Journey One's a first time fund focusing on backing cannabis companies poised for high velocity growth. Helene's the founding partner of the fund and she does everything within her role. In this talk, we discuss problems that alcohol, pharma, and CPG don't address, what makes a cannabis business investable, and obstacles and tailwinds for the cannabis industry. Helene, we like to kick these off just by learning a little bit more about you and your background. So in a couple minutes, can you tell everyone who you are? How did you get to where you are today? Hey, Thank you for having me on the podcast. First off, I've been following Clay and Tyler on their journey in building the Confluence community, and I've used your resources quite a bit, so I really appreciate it. So about me, a lot about me is based on where I'm from. So I'm born and raised in San Francisco, California, General Hospital, which is now the Zuckerberg Hospital. And I grew up as the youngest of four with a single mom. So both of my parents are from the Philippines. And one thing to really know about me is just like hustle, grit, and resilience. Just from the way that I was raised and having really limited resources growing up. So I think one of the things that was telling about my potential future was I was in high school. I grew up in the public school system in San Francisco. I went to Lowell High which is the oldest public school west of the Mississippi, and played pretty competitive volleyball. That was my outlet to get out of the house when you live in a small one-bedroom or studio apartment, like sports is your haven. And I started playing competitive volleyball in high school, but also played club volleyball as well. And I was on the B team my freshman year. And I remember speaking to the A team coach and mentioning, I would love to play D1 volleyball one day. And I just remember him like chuckling and laughing and I made a point to prove him wrong and show him that I could do it. And so that's really a lot about my journey holistically throughout my life is just loving doing super challenging things and then getting the opportunity to really show people versus tell them with actions and execution. So that brought me to go to undergrad at Northeastern in college where I played volleyball. And uh, to give you some details of (laughs) what I look like, I'm five foot on the ground, but I roster five, three. So I have a little bit of a little woman syndrome, but I think it pays off well. Love it. Love it. Tyler, you want to say what's up? Yo, what's good? Hey, Tyler. I'm so sorry I'm late. I'm uh, taking my entrepreneurial journey and uh, and I'm raising money. And that is the <laughs> <enormous> process. <laughs> so. I, I respect that. I'm always, I'm in the same boat. We're basically, you know, as VCs, we're like the founders where we tell them you have to raise and you have to operate. And that's the same thing that I'm doing right now with this fund. So yeah, I feel you so, on that. It's a mofo to say the least. <laughs> but very rewarding. And it's been far too long. My assumption is you just finished giving your background, yes. uh, which is very impressive. And I hope everyone hears how dope you are and that we should probably just keep it jamming. And if not, you'll play, hit the next question and let me get caught up as we go. I got 50 questions to ask you. <laughs> yeah. So I, mean, I, I spoke about my personal background. I always think that's super important because, you know, people, people's jobs change all the time and people don't change as much. But I'm happy to also dive into professional background and work background in cannabis. Let me know what direction you gentlemen want to go into. Let's dive into work. I know you said you wanted to use this to to promote Journey One. So absolutely. As before diving into deeper questions, let's talk a little bit more about Journey One. So give us a general thesis of the fund. Who are you looking to get in front of? Who are you looking to attract investment dollars to? Yeah. So part of the thesis of the fun is a combination of my background before I got into cannabis. So I'll glaze over that a tad bit, but long and short, like I'm a great zero to three operator. Early stage is what I breathe and live and what I've done for majority of my career in about a decade. And I've always worked in emerging markets. So I started my career off at Puma and Reebok corporate and realized that like corporate 
just wasn't as challenging and fun and chaotic as I needed it to be. And I started working in the urban mobility space, specifically the light electric vehicle and electric bike industry back in 2011 and 12, before bike share hit the ground. And it was cool because that's when robotics and EVs were coming off into more mainstream market, but people were still trying to get a sense of what are these products and how do they fit into the mold. Kind of hit the ceiling on that industry, but it gave me an opportunity to work in both Germany, China, Taiwan, and learn about cross-cultural and international business at a pretty young age. So I developed really good EQ. And, you know, when you, when you're going to business meetings in China and you can't speak a single lick of the language, but you can do business with other people, that's a good strong sign that you, <laughs> you have that emotional intelligence to, to be in the room. But I left because at the end of the day, I was working in an industry that was pretty much for bike bros and it just wasn't me. And so I did a hard pivot into enterprise tech and worked for a venture backed startup called VoiceBase. And we did voice analytics. And so I knew nothing about AI machine learning and had to train myself on all of that vernacular. And I built out the customer success team. I worked on strategic partnerships with companies like AWS, Twilio, Gong, all in Zoom. Billion dollar companies that are that I wish my company was at the time. But I was working in the telecom industry and I learned so much about APIs and machine learning, AI, omni-channel communication. And that really gave me a good foundation into truly understanding like the tech landscape in cannabis and these interconnected platforms. And yeah, so how that all brought me to journey one is in 2017, I started taking some personal development courses through a program called Landmark and really worked on what my personal meaning in life was supposed to be or what my mission. And I just didn't want to be a cog in the wheel. At the time, the Me Too movement and the lack of diversity in venture was just like impalpable. And I didn't want to just build another company. I wanted to really make high level, massive impact at scale type of decisions. And so venture was a pretty obvious one for me, especially when you work in the startup ecosystem. Like I think a lot of people fantasize about venture and when you learn about like the economics of it and like the amount of workload, it's not as rewarding as making the money you would make in enterprise sales tech, but it's very fulfilling work. And so I chose to focus on cannabis because the market was really coming to fruition. Uh, being an athlete and uh, getting drug tested sucks, but I grew up in San Francisco and loved, loved weed and all the smartest kids in my high school were stoners. And it just didn't make sense to me that something would be so demonized. So I was lucky to find an opportunity to work for two family offices. I knew nothing about finance before 2017. And some of the firms that I spoke to were only looking for investment banking backgrounds. It, was, it just wasn't me. So it was really challenging getting my foot into the door, like many people, but I just didn't stop. I relentlessly like followed people on networks, like the best VCs. I listened to their podcast, Harry Stebbings, a 20 minute VC, Reed Hoffman. And uh, people always ask me like, who's your mentor? And I would just, I can't think of anything better than podcasts. And that's where I really learn. I worked for two family offices. And then I went to a VC trade school in San Francisco to really refine my investment thesis in cannabis. And that is when they had, the partners at the firm had encouraged me to raise my own fund. I thought they were crazy because I had just really started to learn about the investment landscape in venture, but I guess they saw, you know, potential in me. And so I brought in 200 deals to that program. I led one of my first syndicates that was in 2019 into a company called Flower Co. It is a delivery company that has a Costco membership business model where you pay a member annual membership fee. And then you get wholesale price cannabis, $60 eighth would be roughly around $35, which is a really big, great savings. So since then I've been, I've done probably um, close to 10 syndicates. I've led eight of them and then invested in separate vehicles, but the impetus behind journey one ventures 
is we're, we're f- fully focused on early stage investments in the cannabis industry. And my thesis is that cannabis is the best go-to-market strategy to build the next wave of corn companies. What I mean by that is that companies can start in cannabis and really disrupt in other industries such as big alcohol or pharma. And you're starting to kind of see that trend. For example, the alcohol industry, the global alcohol industry in 2020 was about 1.5 trillion. And that decreased uh, $200 billion compared to 2019. So that market share is going somewhere. And there are micro and macro trends that point to cannabis being part of, in my opinion, the bigger, broader plant-based movement. And the difference is that as a plant, it has wellness, medicinal, and recreational applications versus alcohol that is really just recreational. I don't know if there's many medical benefits on, unless someone individually believes to be so. And then pharma, which is very medicine grade. So it has a very diverse application across many different industries. When you said earlier that you thought it was crazy that cannabis was this like amazing thing and didn't have too much correlation and negativity in your life. And you think about what the actual opportunity is. It reminds me of prohibition because not that long ago, alcohol was illegal. But if you look at spend in like small stores across the US, like beer and alcoholic beverages represent like basically half of their revenue, like Mm -hmm. outside of Right, which we're just not going to include here. But if you really think about it, cannabis kind of has both of those components. It can like capture a decent amount of their market shares or like become a completely new spin category. So I do think it's huge. I do think it can push through a ton of other things. And I totally understand why the VU folks thought you should start your own fund. Yeah, I think outside of that, like it's fun to work in an industry that really helps people. Like I've had former teammates you know, tell me that their parents have stage four cancers and they need help with medicine. Um, Like what products can I recommend? And there's proof that cannabis helps with epilepsy. GW Pharma was acquired by Jazz and they were the first um, pharma cannabis that's publicly traded to really develop medicine derived from the cannabis plant. So we're just, you know, we're just really getting started to many degrees, but I think with a history like cannabis that really was, you know, banned because of the war on drugs and the Nixon administration has a very, it has a pretty troubled background. And I think as part of being, in being part of the industry, it's really important to understand where the history came from and then who's benefiting now and what it could look like. So for me, like my North Star is to get as many minorities and women into executive positions in the industry because I got involved in 2017 was when I first started going to events. And I was like, whoa, like I've never seen a crowd like this. It was, I was in Echo Park and went to some warehouse <laughs> and uh, felt pretty shady, which, you know, it was kind of the cannabis industry before it went wreck. And uh, there's a doorman checking for IDs and you go inside and it was uh, like Home Depot plastic chairs and, and tables and people just trying to sell you God knows what. But it, it was people from all walks of life. And I think that's a, the beautiful so thing. About, but I think that's a beautiful thing about the space is that there's executives from, from the tech industry, from banking, from CPG, from the auto industry. Like there's no one that I cannot think of in the world that doesn't have a space in the industry. That's a really, really good point. On that, your world is vast. Can you tell us a little bit about Journey One and like the general thesis and, and what you're looking at? And then after that, I, I want to touch a little bit on like getting more women, minorities, et cetera, into the space. But please yeah. give us a background on this amazing fund. Yes, it's always an iteration that evolves as the industry changes. But at a high level, I'm focused on C to post series A investments. So I'm targeting a $10 million raise. I'm just going through my initial close right now. I'm actually a 506C fund, so I can publicly market. And the reason why I did that was because I wasn't born on third base. And I think having opportunities to share my story really gives me access to new networks and folks that I think could be super value add to the firm. We're very sector agnostic, but we're highly focused on North America, hemp and cannabis. 
So as long as the company has some relationship to the plant, that's great. I'll give you some examples. So a lot of people are like, why don't you just focus on tech or CPG? Cannabis is a lot more eclectic than that. And as new states come to market and as new laws changes, it opens up a whole slew of innovation that hadn't that hasn't been available. So I'll give you an example. Cannabis is very much so a retail focused channel and delivery. So those are like really the main outlets. It's not a D2C market. So something I've been making, creating a thesis around is what does digital cannabis look like? How do we enable direct to consumer for brands? Right now, it, the, when you're a brand in cannabis, so say, let's, let's talk about Kiva. Kiva is one of the biggest chocolate brands from California. And they, now they have gummies and edibles and they have a big distribution arm. But they can spend so much money on online advertising as well as billboards and try to get that consumer into a retail store. And once that consumer steps in the door, the bud tender is like 80% influential over what they buy. And so that is really the customer and major stakeholder. And at the end of the day, Kiva doesn't really get that consumer data where they can learn about where Sally or Amy came from or what age she is and what type of product she likes. They just get holistic data of how many SKUs they've sold that day. So there's a lot of different challenges within the industry and pain points that I'm looking for to solve by backing these companies. Another company I recently backed is a beverage company called Wonder. So they're one of the first beverages in California to incorporate Delta 8. And Delta 8 is a form of THC. That is more of a body high than Delta 9, which is the head high that everybody talks about. So my thesis around that um, investment was really, beverage is going to be big. You don't have to teach someone how to drink a beverage. What you do have to educate them on is what that like end effect is. Because it's different from being you know, buzzed with alcohol versus buzzed with cannabis. But the exit opportunity is massive. The tobacco industry has definitely fallen very hard in the last couple of decades, and they're looking for ways to stay abreast of to the new trends. The alcohol industry is also looking at the space, and there's a bigger trend towards low alcohol and no alcohol with acquisitions from like C-Lip, I think, was it Diageo who, who bought them? So I try to look at what are venture backable type businesses in cannabis, and what does the potential exit opportunity look like? Sometimes it's really hard to forecast, to be totally honest. So a lot of what I focus on at Journey One is just founding teams and execution. So I'm typically looking for what I call two to three X cannabis founders, founders that have formally started companies in the industry that did well, okay, or really great. And now they're on to their second or third journey in cannabis and just have the network they understand the compliance, they've experienced different kinds of pain points. I think those founders are more likely to succeed than someone walking off the street and building a new cannabis company in their garage. And then on the second side, I'm also looking for really experienced executives who've built businesses and managed like, you know, 100 plus teams outside of cannabis that have tangential experience in the industry. Got you. I actually have a buddy who I have to introduce you to who's doing a really cool cannabis business. Where are you at right now in the country, by the way? Yeah, I'm in Boulder, Colorado. I moved from LA back in February and pretty much the same reason for everybody. The taxes in California, they just, they hurt. And I think when you work a job like in venture, it's nice to be it's nice to be farther away from people when you're next to people all the time, <laughs> just to get some of that alone time. Very, very fair. I guess to summarize, everyone who's starting a cannabis business, can you tell them, I guess, check size, what moment they should reach out to you, or like how to get in touch if you're ready to deploy? Yeah. So it's very rare that we do pre-seed deals. I think it'll, it's more circumstantial than anything. And and that's also because not a lot of institutional cannabis investors are focused on early stage. I would say most are uh, private equity, multi-stage, do more of like series A, post-seed, lead and lead those rounds. 
but I love to get involved really, really early. Like I mentioned before, I love building with founders and the team that I've built around me cover different stacks of the industry in terms of growth and M&A experience, technology experience, cultivation, brand licensing, multi-state expansion, all of that. But our average check size is 250K, upwards of 500. We write very seldom, we seldomly write 500K checks. We'll do as low as 100K if we just want to get our feet wet. But we don't have a follow-on strategy within the fund itself. We participate in follow-on rounds via SPVs in in an opportunity fund when that will arise. So I I try to keep it pretty tight because if we did have a follow-on, it just doesn't really make sense with a $10 million fund. I'd rather put more money earlier on and um, strive for like cash on cash returns. Got you. No, that makes a ton of sense. Well, I have something for you that you'll like because they will love you. I actually think you, of the people in the space that I've talked to, know this and have more passion and real mission than most that I've spoke to. So how about uh, give me a quick thought on the line you spoke on in regards to diversity in the space. If you think about the amount of people who've been incarcerated or put into like a lesser stance or stigmatized or whatever you use, some ism or eyes, right? There's something yeah. that we've had traditionally about the space. Like, how do you feel about inclusion there? Like you will being a woman and not like a white man, right? Like how do, how do you see that? I wouldn't be right am today without access and opportunity. That doesn't necessarily mean money, right? Because I, with size, fund my size, I, my job is not to fund everybody. But what I could, what I can do is try to lower that gate as much as possible with what my firm is doing. One thing that we're working on right now is the investing in social equity business white paper that by the end of this, once this podcast la- uh, launches, it'll be available. And it is a partnership in, with our academy, which is a nonprofit social equity accelerator that doesn't take equity from the companies. And they've done a phenomenal job just by helping business owners that may have not had the opportunity to really start a business before. Massive disadvantage, but doesn't mean you can't do it, right? If you give someone the tools like wood and a hammer and nails, like they can put something together. And some of them might turn out different than the others, but you got to give them the tools at least to see what they can do. And so that's something that's really important to me. And I think I've learned a lot from different emerging managers outside of cannabis and what I could do to give back to the community. And what that looks like is YC, for example, they have all of these templated like safe notes, convertible notes, a company called Meadow, which came from YC actually did a safe note for specifically for cannabis founders. And so I'm looking to do one with a convertible note and also just provide like free resources. So we have a templated deck on our website at journey1.bc. That's a template deck just for cannabis founders. I also created a CRM and Airtable to help founders just get organized around fundraising. So I think these really, these little things go a long way because unless you've done it before, like fundraising can be really daunting. And I personally love it and enjoy it because it at the end of the day, it's pretty much like sales. It's very reward driven. You pitch a product or, or thing or person and you either get the win or you don't. And so I'm, I'm looking for founders to reach out to me and, and let me know, like, what can I help them with from a resource standpoint? So that's that in terms of tools. And then we're looking to launch events once a month on a pitch feedback series. So having one social equity founder, a woman with three different founders, and it's focused on getting feedback. I think it's more important than actually pitching money because if you're like sweating and stressing about a pitch series and you don't get capital, you feel like you fail. But if you do it and you get some really constructive feedback, it changes the conversation. And I think it creates a point of relation where an investor can really give help. And that's how you build relationships, right? And that may be, that may, might change what the outcome might be for whether that investor puts capital into the company or not by developing a relationship with the founder. So 
just looking at small different ways, I don't think this stuff has never been done. It just honestly hasn't been done in cannabis. So I think that can make a big impact with not as much of a pool as other things. Totally agree. So you think what within the cannabis in, uh, industry is, is interesting? Like what's the current state? What excites you most? Are there any tailwinds that have come off of like legalization or up and coming changes? What are you seeing? Oh man, so many things I'm seeing. One with the Biden administration, it's been exciting, but I don't foresee them federally legalizing cannabis, which not, isn't necessarily a, a bad thing. And, but I hope that they do decriminalize cannabis soon uh, because it's, it's just like wrong to see people become new minted billionaires while thousands of people are incarcerated for nonviolent crimes with possession of less than an eighth of cannabis. It's just insane. But what's really interesting about the sector is with general tech, there's major ecosystems like New York, you know, Atlanta's coming up, Austin, uh, Seattle, San Francisco, LA. Those are really core hubs of where people have traditionally put a lot of venture dollars into. In cannabis, it's so diverse. Like, you know, California, Colorado, massive markets, Michigan, the Midwest has really popped off. And, and that's not to a surprise because that's where CPG is really rooted. And Clay and I were talking about earlier, I, I mentioned that I really think that cannabis is just regulated CPG and more. And also in the South, like Florida is a massive market. They have a big population out there, but every state has its own rules and regulations. So it makes it challenging, but it's also an opportunity for folks who can build businesses that can expand multi-state to get an advantage. So those are like the high level stats of the industry. And there's 18 states in Washington, D.C. that have legalized adult use cannabis, meaning 21 plus consumption. And there's about 37 states that now have me medical cannabis programs. That's a lot. So we've really hit the tipping point where this is just super inevitable and it's just a matter of time. But Sectors that are really interesting me interesting to me right now is medical grade and pharma grade cannabis. I think we're uh, years away from that, maybe like seven to 10. But if you're an early stage investor like me, like now is the time to play. So I've been looking at cellular ag companies, basically like biotech and life science plays, and they can essentially create lab developed cannabinoids. They're about 100, you know, 50 plus cannabinoids in the cannabis plant that have all different kinds of medical benefits, such as like CBN is very similar to melatonin. So this company, they can develop lab developed cannabinoids within a one to two week timeframe when it typically takes three to six months to harvest cannabis through a plant and seed. So very similar to like Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger and how they're trying to make a better way to eat alternative meats, a more efficient way to grow them. Like 10% of Massachusetts energy <laughs> is really being used for cultivation right now. And the industry hasn't even popped. So we have to be mindful, like, yes, it's a growing industry, but let's think about how can we can build this in a modern day world where we already have so many limited resources in the U S and tons of global warming issues. I, I thought that you made a really interesting point. So what I've been thinking about a lot as an investor is that sometimes having challenges and getting things started, whether they be regulatory or logistics or cold start problems or scientific, whatever it might be, is actually like a benefit to the people who can figure it out. And you said earlier that it's that this category in a lot of ways is C, like CPG with a few challenges around it, which means that like the best consumer, the best consumer investors, if they can identify people who solve these things are great. Can you talk about some of the challenges? Yeah, CP, regulated CPG with a lot of challenges, not a little, I would preface that. And so everything in this industry is, if you're a plant touching entity, you have to have a license to operate. And 
So depending upon the market that you're in, let's use a few examples. So California versus Illinois. California became REC in 2018 and then medically legalized, the first states medically legalized in 1996. When you wanted to build a brand and sell products, you actually had to build out your entire supply chain because there was no co-manufacturer, there was no distribution, there was limited retailers in the market. And so everything had to vertically integrate. As the market matures, right, just plus three years, now brands can actually license where they technically just sell packaging and do sales and marketing. And then they utilize a co-manufacturer that owns a license to develop their products. And then they can have a distributor who's focused just on distribution and then retailers who, you know, they own a few shops or a dozen shops in California. When you're looking at new markets like Illinois, they're running into the same thing, right? Like the nascency of the market is forcing people to vertically integrate. But at what point does it make sense when all these states go live for everybody to vertically integrate? It's like if you were to buy Cape Cod potato chips and you had a Cape Cod potato chips manufacturing facility in every state, that makes no sense at all. So it's interesting where the evolution of the industry requires certain supply chain structure, but that needs to change over time because it's not sustainable. So that's one thing. But uh, limited supply of capital and financing tools is another big hindrance on growth in the cannabis industry, but it makes it a great space for people like me to play and really take advantage. Like I'm not fighting for getting in a pre-seed round at like a $20 million valuation with the other tech investors. I'm taking my time on diligence and making sure that the background checks check out and, you know, all the little pieces of diligence make sense because I'm not pressed for time as much because there's limited supply of capital. So I'd say like out of the entire capital stack and venture, like maybe two to 3% is less than that is going to the cannabis industry. And it's because there's vice clauses and LPAs and a lot of institutional players are just not in the space. Another hindrance is just taxes in California. There's 35% taxes. So for example, if you're buying a product that's $100, there's an excise tax, a cannabis business tax, a sales tax, that's like 35% of tax already. Out the door, you're paying 140. What that, what the high taxes contributing to is like the hindrance of growth of legal operators and the opportunity for illegal operators to grow their business because that $100 um, product costs that outdoors 140 is actually $70 in the illegal market. So the illegal market's still massive in California. And that's a big challenge, but we're not seeing the same effect in other markets like the Midwest and East coast, where the illicit markets aren't as strong. A majority of illegal pot comes from the West coast. So that creates challenges. And I think it's really important for companies to have good government affairs team so that they can lobby for regulations that make sense. Got you. How are you starting to see a lot of these companies overcome these types of hurdles? Are there any examples of playbooks that you're starting to see or like interesting like hacks or I guess catalysts that have enabled people to get over these kind of things? That's a great question. I wish there was one form standard playbook, but the playbook changes so frequently that to follow a playbook that was like winning two years ago probably doesn't win today. That's what I would say. But I think building a brand across states and licensing it instead of vertically integrating in every state that you're operating in definitely helps scale. It's more about top line revenue because usually a good licensing deal is only like 10, maybe on the high end 15% uh, of sales that go back to the brand. But Say if you get acquired from a company that has the infrastructure, it's a faucet you can just turn on to help with your profit margin in the long term. But so there's different methodologies for growth for some companies where it's grow at all costs, focus on top line. And then hopefully you get a partner that can alleviate some of those supply chain in, inefficiencies and help your margin in the long term. That's on the brand side. I would say on the tech side, it's still very early days. There's a ton of companies that are still working on spreadsheets. I'm looking at different ways for brands to own the customer relationship. 
for them to measure promotions that they're running in stores. A large percent of their sales goes into running like BOGO deals, buy one, get one free, trying to incentivize the customer. But when you do too much of that and it's not consistent and measured, how do you know what's working? That can actually, you could actually be spending a ton on discounted product. So that's another pain point in the market. But yeah, I think going back to play, uh, playbooks, like something I'd love to work on is like CPG discipline in the cannabis industry. I haven't seen that to date. And I would love to work with some of the top folks in CPG who have dipped their toes in this space. And what are some principles that are applicable, but then also build in some nuances with the domain of cannabis? Got you. Can you tell us, I know we're running up on time. So I guess the last question, and then Clay can take us out with the quick fires. Cool. Is that cool? Yeah. So I, I'm, all right, cool. What are your near-term and long-term predictions about the cannabis market? Like where are the spaces you want to focus the most or like how do you see things being completely different? I mean, you talk about that seven to 10 year horizon. Yeah, I think that 80% of the market is going to be run by what we call MSOs. So multi-state operators, it includes companies like GTI, which is Green Thumb Industries, Cureleaf, and Trueleaf. For example, Trueleaf has over 100 retail stores across the U.S. And they're going to succeed because they are just so much more well-capitalized. I think back in 2019, their management teams were having a bunch of shakeouts, but the people now on board seem to know how to really steer the ship. There's going to be big cannabis is what I mean by that. But there's also going to be a craft market similar to like craft beer. And then I think the potential for pharma grade cannabis is so massive. We haven't even really had a chance to study the different chemical compounds in the plant. The main things that make up the beneficial compounds is cannabinoids. So there's about 150. There's terpenes. Basically, there's other terpenes that you can derive from like regular plants, but cannabis terpenes are really rich and they, they're what gives that plant that beautiful like smell or gassy smell. And then flavonoids, which really influence like the color of a plant. So when like flower is like purple, that's the flavonoids. We've only really studied like maybe like 10% of this from a medical standpoint because of limited clinical trials and FDA regulations and all of that and DEA, I, I think there's so many ways that we can give access to people who really need it from a medical standpoint, and then we need to subsidize it so it's actually affordable. The opioid crisis is real, and these are plants that help people. They're not synthetically derived, so I'm super excited about that future. But I think we're going to have federal legalization at some point. It's going to take a couple of years to shake out what the laws are going to even be from an interstate commerce perspective, in a domestic commerce perspective, will we allow importation into the US from you know, Canada or Europe when people have poured hundreds and billions of dollars into developing cannabis? Like cannabis is one of the biggest and fastest growing industries in the US that's actually made in the US. So I think that's an opportunity we should be very conscious about and not try to exploit the hell out of it by just like making it like a low price commodity that we import from China. Those are some of my high level thoughts. Got you. Clay, you want to take us out? Yeah, Helene, I know we're running low on time here. So you tell me what you want to do. I know you got to call it at five or the top of the hour. So we can run through these really quick or we can just hop off here, whatever. No, we're let's, uh, let's run through it real quick. I just gave him a heads up, but thanks for taking note. So, so I, I, ironically, this is supposed to be less than one minute per question anyway. Okay. So, let's do it. Oftentimes it ends up being like 15, but let's try to actually do it in the time. All right, let's do it. Cool. First one we got, what's a recommendation you hear regularly that you think is bad advice? That the cannabis industry is really small. <laughs> and the second one being you need to have a much more like specific thesis I just think that you need to build for flexibility with an industry that, that changes like by the hour. So I pretty, I stand by that pretty hard. Love it. All right. Next one in the last year, what new belief behavior habit has most improved your life? 
something that I personally deal with a lot is anxiety and knowing that being more aware of what triggers my anxiety and how I can be proactive about it versus reactive. Like I was debating like going on anti-anxiety pills and like just didn't want to get addicted to that. And so having that level of awareness and being able to really alter your schedule and routine and framework. So it's like a healthier balance is super important. So I just started with an executive coach and I've done personal like coaching before. And it's just, I just love the accountability. And it's the reason why I started my own firm so I could live the life that works for me. So I, I need to practice that, especially if I'm in a wellness industry. All right, next one, aside from having to say no all the time, what's the worst part about venture? I feel like everything is a high priority. <laughs> and especially in raising a fund, being staying on top of what's happening in the market that moves super fast. I'm far right side of the spectrum extrovert. So when that's part of your job and part of your personal life, it can be quite exhausting. So I think that's something I'm learning. It's, I love this job. Like we talked about earlier, we got to put some boundaries on like how much energy output and like quality of energy can we, you know, give on a daily basis. Yeah, I feel like it comes down to prioritization because there's so many different ways you can go or figure out how to spend your day effectively. At least that's how I've been trying to do it. It's been somewhat effective, but still trying to figure it out myself. Next one, what's the best piece of advice you got for junior VCs or those aspiring to break into venture? Just start doing your own deals. I wish it took me almost a year to do my second SBV for my first one. And I wish I did one every quarter. If Even if you're out of fun that has a massive portfolio, building your own portfolio and learning how to do the back ops of an SPV is so helpful. It gave me the confidence and the understanding of how to structure a fund and it's great practice. So I recommend just, just start doing your own deals. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. And then last one, who is a mentor that you want to give credit to? Wow. I think I mentioned this before that my mentors, I tend to think of our podcasts. <laughs> I've learned so much about top about how top VCs think by listening to podcasts. And Paige Checky and Heather Malloy, who were my first LPs and advisors at Journey One, they focus on growth stage investments and were on the MA team at TerraSend. They really were some of the first women in the industry who supported me in a way that I hadn't been supported. And I, I owe so much gratitude for that. Thanks, ladies. Shout out all of them. Yeah, I think that wraps up for us. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate your time. Cheers. Huge thanks again to Helene for coming on this week. We hope that each of you were able to pick up something valuable from this talk. If you're looking to get in touch with Helene, we've linked her social info within the description below. And if you're a Confluence VC member, you can also access her contact info within our directory. For next steps, if each of you have not submitted your info to become a member yet, you can do that through our website at www.confluence.bc. And also, if you want to become a subscriber to the newsletter, we offer a ton of free resources in there each and every week meant to help you become better at your individual roles. You can subscribe there at www.confluence.substack.com. Hope that helps. Hope to hear from you all soon.